Thank you, Sally. I invite you to stand this morning as we begin our worship time together. Let's pray. Lord, you are kind and gracious and wonderful God. And we've gathered today, Lord, to tell you what a wonderful God that you are. We worship you today in our singing. We worship you by giving you our full attention. We worship you by finding your direction for us for the week ahead. We may follow in your footsteps. Thank you, Lord. We love you. Amen. Please join with us as we sing together 10,000 Reasons for Worshiping the Lord.
pray with me? Heavenly Father, I pray that today we would get a sense, just a glimpse, just a little piece of how much you love us and care for us. Heavenly Father, as a parent, I think about my kids and how much I love them and that unconditional love for them. And I think of how imperfect I am as a parent and how many times I fail. And yet, Lord, you are a perfect Heavenly Father. And I know how much you love us and care for us. I pray that we would all just kind of just catch a glimpse of that. Because when we catch a glimpse of how much you love us and care for us, that while we were sinning, while we were turning our backs on you, you sent Jesus Christ to die for us so that you could have a right relationship, so we could have our sins forgiven, so, so that we could have a right relationship with you so that you could love us and we could love you. <laughs> That's amazing love. I pray, Lord, that as we worship today, as we tell you how much we love you in these songs, as we look to your word, I pray that there would be something that would respond inside our hearts when we catch a glimpse of your love, that there would be something that would just cry out to you and say, Lord, we love you, we love you, we love you. And we want to follow you because we know you have our best interests at heart. Bless us, Lord, today. It's in Jesus Christ's name we pray these things. And all God's people said, Amen. we're going to sing a couple more songs. And as we sing those songs, you can stay right where you're at. Or if you would like to, communion is going to be served over by the double doors. We serve it every Sunday over there. If you would like to be served communion, I want you to know you don't have to be a member of our church. As long as you know Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior, we offer communion to everyone. Also, if you would like to have somebody pray specifically for you, maybe there's something in your life or maybe you're praying for somebody else and you would like to have somebody join you in that prayer. There are Stephen ministers that are standing right now in the back. If you just like to step out and go, there will be someone that would love to pray with you. And, and, and if you would like to just stay where you are, God bless you either way as you continue to worship him.
God is holy. Amen. You may be seated.
Great job, choir. Hey, uh, if Bob Honey was here standing right here, and he is right over there, but if he was standing right here, he would tell you whether this is your first Sunday or whether you've been going here all your life or you're walking down the aisle right in front of me. Hi, how are you doing? You doing all right today? Great, good to have you here. Great, awesome. We want you to feel like you're part of the family here. <laughs> do you feel like that now? I'm so glad. Good. And we do our best around here, Bob would say, to make sure that everybody gets a warm handshake, everybody feels welcome, everybody feels part of the family. And just in case somebody might have slipped in and not had a warm uh, handshake or a smile, we want to just take a moment. Would you stand? Would you turn to those people around you and make sure that they feel welcome? <laughs> We have a great blessing today as a church family. This is something that is never, I checked with Bob, this has never happened before in our church. And that is today we're going to do a baby walk for triplets. <laughs> and Bob is going to come up. We couldn't have anybody else do baby walks beside Bob. I mean, this is his thing. So Bob's going to lead this thing. But I just wanted, I said, Bob, let me just get up and just introduce these triplets just real quick. I can hardly do this. <laughs> it was uh, about two months ago. Two months ago, Steele? Um, yeah, they were born longer than that. But two months ago, they said, Pastor, we need you to come to the hospital. It doesn't look good for one of the, one of the triplets. And went down, and we were with the family, and uh, we prayed. And we said, God, would you, would you reach down and do a miracle in little Luella's life? Which one's Luella? All right, right on the end. <laughs> She's so sweet. If you've ever been in a uh, prenatal unit, they're, they're just, it's, it's, they're incredibly cute. And we just laid our hands on the side of the little bed thing that they had, and we just prayed. And we said, God, please work in her life. <laughs> and God did a miracle. Yay, God, huh? <laughs> so as you see these three babies, as they walk around and do the baby walk today, I not only want you to say, hey, isn't that baby beautiful, but I want you to give a great big, hey, God is great, he's awesome, and he is a miracle-working God, amen? amen? Bob, come and lead us, would you? Thank you, Pastor. I know I'm supposed to be retired, <laughs> but I'm just like the Forest Service. I'll stay on the job. I'll get my pay later. When a good Lord says, well done now, good and faithful servant, then I'll consider that my payday. What a great day we have today. We're going to have a baby march. We have three triplets. I don't know how to act or react to this, but you bear with me. We're going to make it. We're going to have a good time. I'd like for the three, two grandpas and a father to bring those youngsters here. We're going to have a baby march. Steele, have you, you've seen this done? Uh, once, yes. <laughs> once or twice. You want to lead this bunch? Okay. I'll tell you the way this works. We want to go down that aisle, show that baby to that bunch. Okay. Go back to the end, turn around, and come back and show this side. All right. Now, we don't want you to rush. Okay. 
we're just going to cut out on the pastor's time a little bit, and that's, <laughs> that's probably a necessity. So we're going to do that. Three babies, wonderful, two girls and a boy. I told somebody we had three children, but it took us several years to get three. <laughs> but uh, this is exciting, and congratulations to you. And when you get back there, come back up here. We'd like to say a word to you, would you? Right. Let's go. Let's have the music. Let me tell you, when they go by, don't just stare and stand like you're in church. Let's do away with that. When you go by, say, wonderful, excellent, good, beautiful. Let's have a little excitement around here. Triplets, and our <clears throat> Sunday school is growing by leaps and bounds. <laughs> Janelle, Janelle will be most happy. So let's start. Steele, you go right that way. Just follow them. We're going to have a caravan. Dad, grandpas. Sounds to me like this is the fastest way to grow the Sunday school. I don't know what's the matter with the rest of you guys, but we'll let Steele do his thing. Build our Sunday school. I've been asked to tell you their names. Their name is Nora, Jackson Summit, and Luella. So what? I wasn't talking to this thing. I told them here. <laughs> Nora, Jackson Summit, Luella. Triplets. Can you believe that? That is great. Steele, can you tell them apart yet? Yes, sir. You really can. Tell them apart. Kelly, good to see you. I tell you what, we appreciate you. We appreciate you bringing your children to church. Don't send them. Bring them to church. That's what we need. And they are to be congratulated, and thank you very much. I'll tell you what. I want you to come right out here in front and stare, line up right that way. We have some professional photographers out there. They're called grandmas. <laughs> so let's get right up here. The three of you stand, look right straight. Grandma's gonna take a picture, and then we'll say. Very good. Congratulations, let's give them a round of applause. Thank you, did a good job. Good job. Nice to see you. Lord bless you, Tom. Okay, can I not follow that anymore? That that is just that is just brutal. Coming after that, that is awesome. Uh, so anyway, we'll have to work something out with the schedule maybe next time. Uh, my name is Evan Carlson, and I get the privilege of just sharing a couple things that are going on around here. And first and foremost, how is everybody doing? Is everybody blessed? Having a great week? Awesome. Awesome. If you're a guest with us today, we are so, so glad that you've decided to choose Oral Valley Church of the Nazarene as your church home this morning to worship with us, uh, rub shoulders with us, uh, cry with us, laugh with us. It's just an awesome opportunity to be able to get to know you better. And if you haven't connected already, if you want to get connected, how to get plugged in and learn how to get the just further ingrained in our church here and learn more about it, you can uh, do so at our Welcome Center outside um, in the courtyard. If you haven't stopped by there, they have donuts. Who loves donuts? We all do, right? Okay, all right. Some of you aren't raising your hands, but you know deep down inside you love your donuts. Um, so you wanna make sure if you're, uh, if you're a guest with us today, stop by our Welcome Center outside in the courtyard and uh, just get connected with them. Also, another thing we like to always do every single Sunday is our connection card. Um, and if I can have you pull that out, I'm gonna, I'm gonna mention something as you're pulling that out. So as you're pulling that out, I wanted to let you know that um, this coming Saturday, October 19th, is our Class 101. And you say, what is Class 101? Okay, so here's the deal with Class 101. If you turn to your third page, top right corner in your bulletin, so third page, top right corner, 
This is a class that is going to help you learn more about what this church is all about. It, it also is the class opportunity for you to get connected through the means of membership. So if maybe you're wanting to become a member, you're wanting to learn what a membership is, uh, or more about the class or the church, I should say, this is the great class to take. Um, it's really not a class, it's just really a lot of fun. Um, and uh, Pastor Craig is going to be leading it, and there's free breakfast. Yay, breakfast. Uh, so um, if you want to learn more about Oral Valley Church of the Nazarene, how to get connected, how to get plugged in, um, this coming Saturday from 9 to 1130, um, and here's how, that, how this is going to work. On your connection card, if you're interested at all in being a part of this class, please mark that on the connection card um, so that they know how many folks are coming. So just mark that right on there. And uh, maybe throughout the week you're wondering, oh, man, I, I missed that opportunity. I wanted to get connected to do that. You can also visit the website at OVCN. Uh, .org, and you can uh, register right there. There's also a phone number right there to call. So uh, consider that this week. It's coming up this Saturday. Also, I wanted to let you know that any loose offering, this is how this is going to work, any loose offering, any designated checks made to Feed My Starving Children or to the Missions Fund um, uh, is going to help the Feed My Starving Children um, project that we had this last week. The expense to this, uh, to this church is $58,000 to put that on. It's not a, a cheap thing at all. So any loose offering or any checks that are designated to Feed My Starving Children will help the, uh, the church cover those expenses. So consider that as you're uh, writing out your tithes and offerings this morning. Okay, all right, ushers, can I have you guys come forward? Let's go ahead and pray for the offering this morning. Lord God, we are so blessed to know you. Lord, to uh, call you our God and our Savior and Lord, to be able to see those precious children that came up here earlier, Lord, just a, an amazing, awesome God that you are. And uh, Lord, to be able to give back to you and Lord, to be able to learn from you and your word and through Pastor Craig, what a blessing that is. And Lord, we just uh, pray that throughout the remainder of this service, Lord, that this would just be a launching pad into just an awesome week. Lord, that we would use this morning to be just a springboard into an amazing week to love you and to serve you and to live for you. And Lord, we just uh, thank you for it in your name. Amen. I have, a, I have peeked at Pastor's notes, and he's, uh, he's going to be uh, preaching on five things that you, uh, conversations that you need to have with your kids. Oh, man, I'm never going to get through this song. Uh, um, I'm just, I'd just like to testify that I am very, very, very thankful. I had a mother that had those conversations with me. Hmm. Man. Uh, haven't always followed her advice. <laughs> but God is very faithful. And, uh, anyway, uh, listen to what he has to say today. Have those conversations with your kids. Uh, is, had she not? Hey, I don't know. Who knows where I would be? Think about it. Who knows where you would be today? Uh, anyway uh, but through it all God has been so faithful so anyway <laughs> you might need to help me <laughs> go ahead Oh, I 
Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, thank you for our parents. Many of us, Lord, had the great blessing of having our parents have these five conversations with us. Thank you for Rita, Lord, and Tim's life. Thank you for her faithfulness to you and how you've been so faithful to Rita and her family. We give you all the praise and the glory. In Jesus Christ's name, we pray these things. And all God's people in agreement said... Thank you, Tim. Uh, I, I want to show you five pictures this morning. Uh, before we get into the sermon, I want to show you five pictures of Feed My Starving Children. And this was a, a, an unbelievably powerful event we had in our church. Uh, uh, yeah, go, go, go slower. Just, just real slow. Can you go back to the first one? Just go real slow because I want to talk about them just real quick. Yeah, those are great pictures. Awesome. <coughs> five pictures. Are there just five or there's more than that? There's a bunch of them? Okay, good. They're just rotating. I can't stop them. Sorry. Well, let me just talk about it real quick. We had a lot of people. If you want to kind of get an idea, we kind of pushed all the chairs back, 
And we had worship in a way that maybe we've never had before uh, in this church. I guess we had it in January when we did this, but we had a huge amount of people. You know, this is just really bothering me, Larry, that they're looking up there instead of looking at me. <laughs> so as you're looking up there on the screen, let me give you the, the details. Feed My Starving Children, we had 994 volunteers. Isn't that great? And I know the question you're asking, but what about the meals? Our goal was 250,000. I'll get to that in just a second. We had, uh, we filled uh, 1,224 boxes. Meals, we didn't make 250,000. We had 264,384. Let me give you uh, some terms that you'll just kind of get your mind around, because that's hard for us to understand. If I could give you this number, here it is. It's 724 children that every day for the next year are gonna have one nutritious meal that they didn't have for the next year, 724. That's an awesome thing. That is a great thing. Let, let, Let me tell you how I see this. Number one, the first thing, when I think about Feed My Starving Children, I think of, of Jesus saying, you, when I was hungry, you fed me. And we go, well, when did we do that? You see, when we do something like this, we are doing this in the name of Jesus, and we are, we are, we are obeying the commandment to feed the hungry like Jesus gave us. Amen? Amen? And then the second thing I would say is this had an incredible community impact. There were lots of people. I was here uh, uh, 7.30. I was here with my family. I was here with our small group. Robin brought uh, many people from her work to help out. And this is a lot of people invited people to come with them uh, in the community. And and I think our community saw that our church really loves and cares. Someone said, well, what are you getting back out of this? Nothing. Nothing. I mean, we're just doing what we're told to do by Jesus Christ, and it's not that we're getting anything back. And, and uh, maybe you saw the, uh, the news articles in the newspaper, or maybe you saw on TV the, several newscasts uh, did live broadcasts from here. And then the third thing I would say is, is children's lives are changed. 724, one meal a day for an entire year, 724. That's an awesome difference. And it uh, goes back to our sermon series that I did last month when I said, together, we can make a difference. And we did. That's an awesome thing. I, I want to get into the sermon because I don't have a lot of time today. I, I want to talk about families make a difference. I, I, different sermon series, families make a difference. Today we're on the second. Next week will be the last one. I, I wanted to talk three times, and I don't do this every year, but I wanted to talk three times about parents and our responsibility. And, and Rob and I went to see uh, Sandra Bullock, the movie Gravity. Ha- have you heard about this movie? It's a pretty good movie. It's excellent. It's about uh, floating around in space. And uh, I always thought when I was young, I wanted to be a, a, a space explorer and do something like that. It looked always so cool. After this movie, I'm not going in outer space. I just want you to know that. <laughs> in, in this movie, she gets pretty desperate and she makes this phrase. She says this, this, this statement and it made such an impact on my life. I, I, I wrote it down. I, she said this at, at a really desperate point in her life. She said, I need somebody to pray for me. And then she thought about it and she said, I would pray for myself, but nobody taught me how to pray. I thought, oh man, we as parents, our job is so important to make sure our kids understand some basic things about life, some basic things about God and how much he loves us and cares for us. There are some things that we need to make sure that we teach our our children. And so what I want to do today is I want to talk about five Five conversations that you need to have with your kids. And at different ages, this is not just having it at one time. These are conversations that you have as your kids are growing up. And at different points, whether your kids are five or whether they're 50, you need to have these conversations. And you need to keep on having these conversations with your kids. And if you have your sermon notes, it's a half sheet of paper. It looks like this. It's in your, it's in your bulletin. Tim referenced it earlier. If you're watching live streaming, we're so glad that you're a part of our family. I hope you were able to rejoice with us in the worship time and the singing. But I hope you were also... Uh, Uh, able to uh, rejoice with us over the the triplets that were here. But if you want to see these notes, it's a tab right over my left shoulder, and you can hit that tab, and and these same notes that we have in our hands will flip down. 
But listen, these are five conversations that you need to have uh, help your, your kids understand. There are five truths. And if you look at the notes, how, how I set this up, it's five truths that you need to talk with your kids about. And then, and then it's five questions that go along with those truths that you need to help your kids ask and answer in their lives. And, and, and uh, Bob took up so much of my time. <laughs> no, that's not true. I came in here with this idea. I, I, I'm gonna go right to the middle of your notes. So if you have your first page, just mark off the first half. I, I, I'll get to that some other time, but I, I don't have time to get to that right now. I wanna talk about these five truths so much, I wanna make sure I get these five in. The first truth that you need to, to help your, your children understand is this. I was planned for God's pleasure. Would you write that in? I was planned for God's, in other words, God made me to love me. Any parent knows this, that you take pleasure in your kids. And I thought about that, I went, oh, hold on one second. Maybe not all the time, right, mom and dad? You guys aren't gonna agree with me on that one? But come on, there's that, we take pleasure watching our kids, watching them grow up, watching them do things. I'll never forget my daughter when she was running in track and my son when he ran in track and my, my daughter ran the 800 and she went to state. She was incredibly good and, and uh, my son went to state and I'll, I'll never forget, it, not even when they were at state, just when they were doing just the regular track meets, they would be running around the track and, and as I was running around the track with them on the inside of the track, A couple of times I ran stretches, didn't I, call them? <laughs> I want to tell you, there's something that happened inside of my heart that just, I, I just wanted to go over it when they got done and hug them and say, I'm so proud of you. You did such a great job. They, they were awesome. There was something inside, however they did. It didn't matter if they got first or last. It, that, that wasn't the thing. That they were out there competing. And as a parent, I was so proud of them. And the, uh, parents get pleasure watching their kids do things. And God takes pleasure in his family. Every child, the first thing every child needs to know is that God made me to love me. Look at this verse, Revelation chapter 4. You, God, God created everything, and it is for your pleasure, God, that they exist and they were created. And so from a very early age, I need to start, as a parent, I need to start telling my kids, number one, you were made by God. You were made by God, you were made for God. And until they understand that, life is just not gonna make sense. If we could help our kids just catch a glimpse, as I prayed earlier, of how much God loves us and cares for us. And then this is a great thing, that God gave us a capacity. This is a wonderful thing in response. Not only how much God loves us, but in response to his love for us, God has given us a capacity to turn around and know him and to love him back. And, and, and that's called worship. Getting to know God, loving God, that's what worship is all about. It's not just about singing. It's about telling God, knowing how much God loves you, and then telling him how much you love him, and then, and then loving him. So the first question that, that a child has to learn to, to come to grips with uh, at some point in their life is, is the question of, of worship. If you have, there's not a space for you to write this in, but just off to the side, uh, uh, see where it says truth and then Q is for question. Just off to the side, just write question of worship. And here's, you have a lot of things in, in your life, but here's the question of worship is, and if you write this in, what will be the center of my life? The, the reason I phrase it like that is because whatever is at the center of your life and my life, that's what we worship. A lot of things we can worship a lot in life. A child grows up and, and has lots of options. They can, you know, at the center of their life can be sports. At the center of their life can be hobbies or school or family or a center of their life can be a career or having fun. And all those things are good things. Not, those aren't bad things, but they just don't belong at the center of their life. And I'll tell you why they don't belong at the center of our children's lives or even our lives is because when the heat is on in our lives, that's not going to be what you hold on to. It's huge to understand that. You, you need something that you, when you hold on to it, when it becomes the center of your life, you can hold on to it for, forever. And if you center your life on a career, isn't this true? Maybe I could get someone to testify to this today, that if, if your career is at the center of your life, there is a time, there could be a time when, your life, when you lose that career. If the center of your life is money, I've seen people have lots of money and, and, and in a short period of time, they just lose it. Or if the center of your life is good looks or health or anything else. See, all that stuff is insecure. 
if that's the center of your life. And so we have to teach our kids, whether at five or whether at 50, that, that the center of our lives, it, it ought to be on God because that cannot be taken away from us. How, how do you know what's the center of your life? It's the thing that you think about the most. See, whatever you think about the most, then that's the center. That is what you're centering your life on. And so all these other things, they're good things, they're fine things. School, activities, all, you know, those are hobbies, sports, careers. Those are great things. They're not bad, but God created them and he made them for our enjoyment, but they should never be the center of your life. And so the first truth that I want you to teach your kids to understand is that, that God uh, created me for his pleasure. I was made by God for God. And my job in life is to get to know him, to, to love him. That's what worship is. L let, let me show you a great couple of verses. We, we know these verses around here. We, we turn to them quite often. It's Matthew 22. Somebody asked Jesus what, what was most important in the Old Testament. He said, I can boil it down to this. He said in, in Matthew 22, verse 37, Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second one is just like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love the Lord your God with all your heart. It's the first thing we need to teach our kids to love God. And, and so the first critical choice that, that, that a child has to learn, and, and, and this is a choice that they're going to be making over and over and over, is simply this. Am I going to live a self-centered life? or am I gonna live a God-centered life? That's the fundamental issue here. And as a parent, my first responsibility is to help them understand why they were created. They were created to be loved by God and then answer this question, am I gonna live a self-centered life or am I gonna live a God-centered life? Is it gonna be about me, 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 or is it gonna be about God? And when you become a Christian, you center, the center of your life changes. And, and Jesus doesn't just become one piece of the pie in your life. Some people think of it like this. Well, well there's the, 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 uh, the the work piece and the play piece and the, uh, the Dallas Cowboy piece of my life and the, you know, all these pieces of our life and Jesus just kind of becomes one piece of that. No, 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 I, I want you to understand that's not, that's not what God wants. He doesn't want you to come, he doesn't want to become just a piece of your life. He wants to become part of the whole thing. And anybody pie lovers here? Do I have somebody? I mean, just pie is your thing. Anybody? Yeah, a lot of us. You know, I, you know I, just real quick, just turn to the person beside you and, and tell them what your favorite filling in the pie is. Just turn to them real quick and just tell them that just real quick. That's important to what I'm saying. Okay, listen up. Jesus doesn't want to be just a piece of the pie. He wants to be the filling of your whole pie. Ooh. He wants to be part of every part of your life. Are you with me on this? See, it's all throughout the Bible that God doesn't, God doesn't want to just be, hey, okay, I come on Sunday and I do my God thing on Sunday morning for an hour where I sit there and listen. Listen, it want, God wants so much more than that. He wants to be a part of your whole life. He wants to be the filling. The Bible says in Jeremiah, I will give them a single-minded purpose in life to honor me for all time for their own good and for the good of their own children. And I love this passage because it talks about what we talked about last week, that when you put God at the center of your life, not only is your life blessed, not only is your child's life blessed, but remember last week when we talked about the multi-generational blessing that God gives us when we follow him, and that's what happens when you put God at the, at the center of your life. Here's the question, how can you tell uh, when you, or how can you tell when your kids have, ha don't have God as the center of your life? That's a good question, isn't it? Here's how you tell if God is not the center of your life, is you worry. <laughs> worry, and if you, are you familiar with that word? Worry is a sign that at that moment, God is not at the center of your life. Worrying is like this, this warning light that blinks, 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 and, 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 and you have taken God off the center of your life. You're not trusting God. There's something else that you're, you're more focused on. Worry is like the warning light in your life. That's the first conversation you need to have. I gotta keep on moving here. The second conversation, the second truth that you need to share with your children is I was formed for God's family. I was formed for God's family. God says, I want you to be a part of my family. 
See, here's what happens. When you, when you teach this, when you share in this conversation with your kids, all of a sudden it gives them such value and it gives them such worth. If God loves me and he wants me to part, be a part of his family forever, you see what that does for my security? It doesn't matter if I don't feel that I'm, I'm good looking enough. It doesn't, feel if I'm, it doesn't matter if I don't feel like I'm talented enough. It doesn't matter if I feel like I'm smart enough or whatever. God says that stuff doesn't matter. Here's what matters. God says, what matters is that I made you and I want you to be a part of my family forever. Do you, do you realize what that does for a child's self-esteem when I realize that I was created, I was made for God's family? And it's why we so, in our church, we, 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 love, we love parents that uh, go through the adoption process or go through the foster care process. In fact, we, we care about this so much in our church that November 3rd, we're gonna roll out this ministry in our church where, where, where parents that are adopting or parents that are foster care parents, that we as a church, we wanna surround those people and we want them to know that as a church, we're here for them, amen? And we're gonna roll out this ministry where you can become a part of, of helping a family that's going through the adoption or has adoptive kids or, or has foster kids. We think that's huge in our church, why? Because God looked at each one of us, God looked at you, God looked at me, and he says, I love you and I wanna adopt you into my family. See, that's powerful. Read with me Ephesians chapter, Ephesians chapter one, it's in your notes here, right underneath point number, truth number two. Let's read it out loud. His unchanging plan has always been to adopt us into his own family by bringing us to himself through Jesus Christ. You know what that passage says? That if anybody asks you, are you adopted? Well, yes, I am. And you say that with pride. You say that God has adopted me into his family through Jesus Christ. God wants you to be a part of his family. God never meant for, for you to go through life alone. In fact, God looked at Adam and, 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 and said this. You, you go back to Genesis. God says, it's not good that you're alone, Adam. And God hates loneliness. He hates it. And that's why God created a spiritual family. And, and, and that family is called the church. Ephesians chapter one, we just read it. God's unchanging plan is that he would adopt us into his family. When you get to heaven, there's two things that you're gonna do in heaven. Did you know this? That you're gonna love God and you're gonna love your family. Those two things are gonna happen in heaven. You're, you're gonna love God and you're gonna love his family. Well, what does God want you to do while you're still here on this earth? He wants you to practice. God wants you to practice so that when you get to heaven, you don't look around and go, well, what am I supposed to do like a doofus? You, you want to be, isn't that right? You want to be practiced up on this. You, you already know how to do this. You, you know how to love God. You know how to love his family. Well, who's your family? Who's my family? Who, look around you right now. Come on, seriously, look around you. You're, are you looking? Look behind you. There's a bunch of people in the front. You need to look at all these people behind you. They're your family. If you're watching online, Look at me, I'm your family. Some of you are going, well, can I, can I get another family? <laughs> God never meant for us to go through life alone. So the second question you gotta ask your kids, you gotta help them ask it, and then you have to help them answer this question as they grow up. They'll answer it different ways at different stages of their life. This isn't a one-time answer. This is the question, if you wanna write this to the side, not a place for you to write this, but this is the question of fellowship. The question, the first question was question of worship. Here's the question of fellowship. Who will be, write this in on that line, who will be my companions in life? This is so important, who will be my companion? I, I wonder how many parents could stand up today and you, would, you could give testimony, you could tell a story about when you hung out with a group of people, they were the wrong companions and it led you down a path and, and it messed up maybe part of your life. I, I wanna tell you this, kids are gonna be a part of a group, it's a given. The only question is, are they gonna be a part of a good group or a bad group? See, here, here, here's the reason why at this church, 
we spent so much energy and staffing and money and, and, and resources and emphasis on things like children's ministry and youth ministry and young adult ministry in this church. Why? Because we want our groups, we want our, our children's groups, our youth groups, our young adult groups, we want them to be so good, so cool, that when kids are looking for a place to hang out in a group, which they just naturally do, it's the way we're wired, they go, well, pff, I wanna hang out with the church group because they're cool. There's fun stuff going on there. I, I wanna be a part of, of the church group group kids. And so we put major staffing and major money and, into children's ministry and youth ministry and student work ministry. And, and it's because we care so much about the next generation. Here, here's a, so the question is this, who am I gonna hang out with? You as a parent, you need to help your children Understand the impact of friends that friends have on them and, and understand the importance of choosing good friends rather than friends that pull you away. Hey, Gideon, you're my friend, right? Would you help me out? Just real quick? No? It just take two seconds. You don't have to answer. You don't have to talk. Just stand right here. This is Gideon, my good friend right here. He's awesome. Yay, Gideon. Okay, Gideon, you stand right on that first step right there and hold my hand. Okay, in fact, we're gonna lock arms like this. Now, let me ask you something real quick. Who has the greater uh, ability? Do I have the better ability to pull you up or do you have the better ability to pull me down? Okay, let's, that's, that's a good question. Okay, turn around, let's ask the congregation. Let's take a vote real quick here. If Gideon and I are here and I'm up here, he's right here and we're holding hands, does he have a better ability to pull me down or do I have a better ability to pull him up? I'm not quite sure I understand which one. Did you think they said up or down? Yeah, I'm not sure. So let's go. How many people think Gideon has a better ability to pull me down than I have ability? Okay, how many people think I have a better ability to pull him up? Two? There's no way. Okay, Gideon, you pull me down. Okay, you ready? No, I don't want you to pull me down. Thanks, good job. You did great, Gideon, you were awesome. Now listen, this is why I say this. It's always easier to pull somebody down than it is to pull somebody up, amen? So you need to make sure that your child's friends, your friends, are people that are pulling your child up rather than pulling them down because if they're pulling them down, your kids are going down. This is the fellowship question. It's the belonging question. Every child grows up thinking, do I belong? Some of you grew up and, and there was that time in your life where you just felt like you didn't belong anywhere. Nobody accepts me. My parents, they don't seem to accept me. My peers don't seem to accept me. My teachers don't seem to accept maybe you, Maybe you knew the pain uh, of not belonging in your life because every child, listen, every child is wired, is made by God in such a way that they have a desire to belong. Even at the age of 50 or 60 or 70 or 80 years, we have within us still, because we are created this way, we have a desire in our lives to belong. We don't wanna be by ourselves. We, we wanna be part of fellowship. Why? Because we were wired the way, uh, that way. We were wired for worship. We were wired for fellowship. That's the way God made us. You can't ignore the way God wired you. The Bible says this in 1 Corinthians 15. Do not be fooled. Bad companions run, or excuse me, ruin good character. Anybody wanna just say, yep? It's true. Bad companions ruin good character. So what we need to do is the opposite. We need to teach our kids that if they want to succeed in life, the number one factor relationally in their life is good, that's going to determine whether they succeed or whether they fail in life is the kind of friends that they choose. The friends you choose will either hold you back or spur you on. And the Bible says if you want to be successful, and I know you want your kids to be successful whether if they're five or if they're 50, you want your kids to succeed, then you have to help them see the importance of choosing the right friends. If your kids are not involved in our children's ministry and student ministry and young adult ministry, you need to do everything you can to get them involved because it is a, it's crucial to the success of their life. As I said, God never meant for us to go through life alone. He prepared us to be a part of a spiritual family. It's called the church. Romans chapter 12 says this. The Bible says, since we're all one body in Christ, we belong to each other, and each of us needs all the others. 
Now, I want you to circle two words in the, in the notes there. Number one is the word belong. Number two is the word needs. As a parent, two of the most important truths relationally that you need to teach your kids growing up, no matter what age they are, is we belong in the family of God. You, you need to teach your kids to love the church because it, it, it's going to be with them. That spiritual family is going to be with, with them all the way through eternity. And then the second part to this, not only do we belong in God's family, the church, but we need each other. Let me tell you why that's important for parents to teach this to our kids, because everything in our society goes the opposite way of that. We don't live in just an age of individuality. We live in an age of hyper individuality where everybody is supposed to be a lone ranger. If it's going to be, it's got to be me. I've got to do what's best for me. I got to be me. And as a result, Depression is on the rise, emotional illness and conflicts are on the rise because we're in a society that puts kids out there and, and to hang out for themselves and, and they have no support. It used to be uh, back when I grew up that, that parents lived close to their families and that family gave kind of a support and gave, gave a, an infrastructure there. But kids now, because our, our, our society is such on the move and we're, a lot of times we're away from our, our, our parents and our grandparents, kids are out there on their own and they don't have a sense of belonging. They don't realize that they need each other. The truth is, for me to be healthy, I need you. As much as you're not going to like this truth, you need me. <laughs> we need each other. And that's what the church is for. A, a, a place that God has created like a family so that we belong. Okay, got to keep on moving. There's a third truth that we need to teach our children, no matter what age they are. Number three, if you flip your notes over, and that is, here's the third truth. I was created to become like Christ. When you teach this one, it's going to explain why you have so many problems in your life and why your kids have so many problems in their life. I was created to become like Christ. That's the truth. This is the third conversation you need to have with your kids. Ephesians chapter 1. It is in Christ that we find, we find out who we are. Most people don't know who they are. It's in Christ that we find out who we are and what we're living for. Part of the overall purpose, God's got a bigger plan than just me. We talked about that last week. Part of the overall purpose that God is working out his plan in everything and in everyone. Paul is saying here that I was made to become like Christ. Romans chapter 8 verse 29 says this, for, the very, uh, for from the very beginning, God decided that those who came to him should become like, circle that, his son. Every parent knows this phrase. Like father, like, or like mother, like daughter. Or, or, you know, we're growing up and somebody says to you, you're, you're just like your dad. Hopefully that's, that's a good thing. <laughs> or you, got your, you have your mom's eyes. Or you've got your dad's sense of humor. That's a compliment to, to, to a parent. And God wants his children to grow up to be like him. Not God's. Come on. Don't, don't, don't go that way. But godly. You're never going to be a God, but God wants you to be like him. Well, what's God like? The Bible says this very clearly that God is love, he's joy, he's peace, he's patience, gentleness, kindness, integrity, generosity, humility. God wants us to grow up to be like him. And so he came to earth in the form of a human being. Jesus Christ came in human form to show us what God is like. And so we looked at Jesus and we said, oh, that's what God's like. However, if God is going to make you like Jesus Christ, that he has to take you through the same things that he took Jesus Christ through. Does that make sense? Listen, if he wants you to be like Jesus, if he wants your, your son or your daughter to become like Jesus Christ, he has to take your son or daughter through those things. Were, were, were there times in Jesus' life when he was lonely? Sure. Were there times when he was tempted to be discouraged? Yes. Were there times where Jesus was misunderstood by other people? Yes. Were there times when he was criticized? For sure. Attacked? Yes. Were there times when Jesus was tempted to, 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 in amazing, tough ways by, by, by the devil? Yes. Okay, if God let his son, Jesus Christ, go through that experience, then what makes you think that you're exempt from that or your child is exempt from that? See, listen, see, we get this all mixed up. This, hear me on this, this is not heaven. <laughs> heaven is where there's no sorrow. Here's what the Bible says. In heaven, there's no sorrow, no sin, no suffering. 
Some of you knew Mary Timler. Mary Timler passed away this last week, and I'm, I'm going to do the funeral tomorrow morning at 11 o'clock down at Evergreen. And, 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 and one of the things I'm going to say tomorrow is I'm going to go to the book of Revelation where it said, in heaven there's no sin, no sorrow, no suffering, no temptation, no trials. And, and, and listen to me. Here, here, I want to make sure you know this. In heaven, your body is going to work perfectly. Yeah. <laughs> I'm getting older. I need to hear that sometimes. <laughs> Your minds are going to work perfectly. Your relationships are, everything is going to be perfect in heaven. Would you agree with me that not everything is perfect here on this earth? <laughs> Our world is broken. And here, here's one more part to that. Our world is broken and it's broken by sin. Your job is probably not perfect. You know, your marriage doesn't work perfectly. Your body doesn't work perfectly. Our world is broken by sin. The weather isn't always perfect. And I hate to say that because the last couple days, it's been about perfect. <laughs> but I want you to know this. There's times when we go through natural dis- Why do we go through those, those natural disasters? Because this planet is broken by sin. This is not heaven. Why didn't God just get rid of all that stuff? It's because he's using it now. The Bible says this. This is the most amazing thing. God can use, not that he causes this, but God can use evil in your life for his good if you'll let him. You say, where do you get that from? You go to the Old Testament, you go back to a great illustration of this in the story of Joseph. Remember the story of Joseph? His brothers threw him into slavery. And here's Joseph, and he says to his brothers later on, he says, he looks at his brothers and he says, you meant this for bad, and it was evil. But God used it for good. Amen? Amen. Because God is more interested in building your character than he is in making you comfortable. Really? God is more interested in growing you up than having you have a happy time here on earth. And that's hard for us to understand. The happy time is going to be forever and ever and ever when we get to heaven. This is, when we're here on this earth, this is the learning stage. This is the testing. This is the, this is the school, the preschool. This is the warm-up act. And listen, if God's going to make you Christ-like, if he's going to take your child and make your child like Christ, then, then it means not everything is going to go right in their life or your life. If everything went your way, your entire life here on this earth, you'd be a spoiled, rotten brat. But God wants to teach you, it's not about you. Life is not about you. It's about loving God. It's about loving other people. Matthew 22, we read that. If you miss that, then you're going to be the most miserable person because you'll always be asking, why? Why is this happening? God, why did you let this? I'll I'll tell you why it's happening to you, to teach you some things you wouldn't learn any other way. How do you learn patience? You learn patience when you're forced to wait. How do you learn how to love? You learn how to love when you're, you're trying to love somebody that's hard to love. How, how do you learn peace? You learn it in the middle of chaos. Anybody uh, can be peaceful when everything's going your way. So when your kids are growing up, if, if they don't learn this, that I was created to be like Christ, then they're going to go through life going, why? Why me? God, why this? Why now? Why is this happening? My question is, why do you think you and I should be exempt when God didn't exempt his son, Jesus Christ? There's a a, a T-shirt that I have, and I've talked about it before. On the front of it, it says, life is good. Have you heard of that brand of T-shirt? Life is good, and life is good. But listen, not all things in life are good. Let's be mature about this. In in fact, a lot of things in life are tough. They're bad. A a lot of things in life are evil. But God is so great that God can even bring good out of bad in your life and my life. He can bring good out of disease. Not that he caused it, but he can bring good out of that disease. He can bring good out of death. He can bring, listen to me, this is how powerful he is. He can bring good out of divorce in your life or my life. He can bring good out of anything in your life if you will take those pieces of your life that are so broken and just say, God, here they are, and he'll take them and he'll change them around, and he can bring good out of bad in our life. If you teach that to your child, then they'll be light years years ahead of anybody else in emotional, in mental, or in spiritual stability. 
The third truth, I was created to become like Christ. And everything that happens to me is either a stepping stone to make me more like Christ or a stumbling block to f- push me away. It's either that, that situation that's, that, that I don't like in my life, it's either going to make me better or it's going to make me bitter. And, and I, I, don't, I don't know what's, what's going to happen to me, but I do know what my response needs to be. And my response needs to be, just like Tim sang about earlier, great is thy faithfulness. God, I know I can trust in you. And I don't know why this is happening, but God, I know I can trust you because I know this, that not everything is good in the world. There's a lot of bad But here's what I know, that God is always good, and I can always trust God. He is always faithful to me. Amen? I was created to become like Christ from the very beginning. That has been God's plan. And that brings us to this third question that we need to help our kids ask and answer. Here's the question. What will be my character? What will be the character of my life? Question number one, what's going to be the center of my life? Question number two, who are going to be the companions in my life? Question number three, what's going to be the character of my life? What what am I going to become? Our character is more important than our career. We spend so much time preparing our kids for their career in life. Listen to me, I'll tell you, we want something that's far greater than that. And it's preparing our kids' character. Philippians chapter two, in your lives, you must think and act like Christ. That means your child's attitudes, their values, their character. We need to teach our kids that this life is just a preparation for the next. And while you're here on this earth, you are going to be tested. When you're going through school, you are going to be tested. When you get out of school, you are going to be tested. When you get married, you are going to be tested. Amen? (laughs) Some of you are looking at your spouse going, oh, yeah. By the way, let me just stop there just real quick. Marriage doesn't create problems. Marriage marriage just reveals the problems that are already there in our lives. Have you figured that one out? I don't like that very much. That's not a good statement. Listen, I I watch people and they get out of a marriage. Oh, pastor, that that was a bad marriage. And then I watch them, they go into another marriage and it's like, I I watch them, I know what's gonna happen. They take the problems that were in this marriage and they just take them into the next marriage. Because you know what the problem really is? You. (laughs) You just take you into the next one. And unless you change, you're going to take that same bad pattern into the next marriage. The point is here is that we're going to be tested. Everything in life is a test. Every situation, good or bad, is a character-building opportunity. And we need to teach that to our kids. So the the critical question, as our kids are growing up, am I going to be more interested in their comfort, or am I going to be more interested in their character in their life? Comfort doesn't last. Character lasts. Number four. We're almost done. In fact, I'm just going to give these two, and then uh, we'll talk about them some other time. Number four, I was shaped to serve God. Uh, Rick Warren talks about uh, our spiritual shape, and I did a, a, a three-part video series on this with small groups. If your small group went through this, it was three 15-minute segments where I talked about our spiritual shape. Our spiritual shape is this, our spiritual gifts, A, S, H is our heart, what we love to do, A is our abilities, those, those things that we do really well, uh, A, uh, P is our personality, and E is our experiences in life. And the the Bible says this in Ephesians chapter 2, it is God himself who made us what we are, and it's given us new lives from from Christ Jesus, and long ago he planned that we should spend our lives watching TV. (laughs) Just wanted to make sure you're awake. Everybody, okay, everybody's awake. Okay, sorry, I I misread that. And, and, And that we should spend our lives, say it with me, helping others. That's what God shaped us. God created us. He said, this is, I, I'm going to put these things in your life, and then I want you to use who you are to help other people. The Bible says it is only in giving ourselves away that we find out what life is really all about. And listen to me. I want to help you out with this. It's not about you. I was shaped to serve God. That brings me to the fourth question. The fourth question is this. What contribution will I make? Question number one, what's the center of my life? Question number two, what companions will I have? Question number three, what character will I have? And and question number four, what contribution will I make with my life? You need to help your kids ask and answer that question. What's going to be the, how how am I going to give back? How am I going to take those God-given talents and how am I going to use them? Not for my benefit. How am I going to use them to benefit other people? 
Listen, when you can look at your kids and you can say, listen, this is what I see. I see this gift in your life. You'll never know what that could possibly do when you say, I think that God could use that in your life to help other people. Oh, that that would just possibly change their life. And then conversation number five. The fifth truth is this. I was made for a mission. I was planned for God's pleasure. I was formed for God's family. I was created to become like Christ. I was shaped to serve God. I was made for a mission. John 17, Jesus said, in the same way that you've given me a mission, God, I'm giving them a mission. And part of your mission is telling other people the good news about Jesus Christ. You say, well, what's the good news, Craig? Here it is, that you don't have to earn your way to heaven. That's great news. That salvation is a free gift. That's great news. That everything I've ever done wrong that I don't have to walk around my life with this bag of guilt on my shoulder and carry it around and go, I've been bad, I've been wrong, I, I, don't, I, I don't deserve to go to heaven. I don't have to carry this bag of guilt around anymore. I can give it to God and I can say, God, I'm sorry, and I can walk away with a clear conscience. Amen. That's great news. Some of you are going, man, that's awesome. The, the, the reason for your life is, is the good news. God wants you to live with him forever. That's, that's good news. What will be that message that you communicate to other people with your life? Edgar Guest wrote this poem. I think it applies to parents so well. He wrote, I'd rather see a sermon than hear one any day. I'd rather one walk, would walk with me than merely tell the way. The eye is a bitter, better pill and far more willing than the ear. Fine counsel is confusing, but the example is always clear. I can soon learn how to do it if you'll let me see it done. I can watch your hands in action, but your tongue too fast may run. A lecture you may deliver, listen parents, listen, this is you. A lecture you may deliver may be very wise and true, but I'd rather get my lesson by observing what you do. For I may misunderstand you and the high advice you give, but there is no misunderstanding in how you act and how you live. So here's my homework. Here's what I want you to do. Mom, dad, in fact, everybody here. I want you to take these five questions that we've just gone through. And I want you to sit down. Here's your homework. And I w- there's going to be a test next week, so you better do this. I want you to take these five questions, and I want you to work through them in your life. Not your child's life, in your life. Because you can't pass this stuff on unless you've worked on it yourself. And so what's the center of your life going to be? Are you going to live a self-centered life or a God-centered life? What's what's going to be the community of my life? What's going to be the character of my life? What what do I want to see changed in my life as far as the character? And then number four, what's the contribution that I want to make with my life? How, How do I want to help other people? And then number five, what will be the communication of my life? That's the fifth question. What does God want to say to the world through my life? It'll force you to think about the direction of your life. If you answer these five questions, it'll become apparent that there's some things that you need to add to your life. It'll become apparent when you, read the, when you work through these five questions, it'll become apparent there's some things you need to subtract from your life. Listen, it'll help you become more selective with your life. If you haven't already finished uh, the 101 class that Evan talked about earlier about belonging to a church family, we have that, that class coming up Saturday. I'd encourage you to do that. But take these five questions and work through them. And It'll be an awesome thing. All right, I want to close with this. I'm out of time. Somebody sent me an email yesterday, and I printed it off. They wrote, last Sunday you prayed for the congregation. Remember when I was down here at the end of the service last week, and I prayed this blessing over you? You prayed to the congregation to have an experience in their life that would serve as a testimony to others. It would be something where God clearly is the only answer. You'd be essentially asking God to do what is impossible for you to do alone. God answers, uh, God's answer to your prayer would serve as a testimony to others and a reminder to you and your family of the importance of, learning, of leaning on God rather than your own strength or perhaps, uh, uh, or p- perhaps the temptations of the world today. And that's almost like a journal. This person writes, it's now Sunday, October 6th. I'm listening to your prayer, Pastor, for the congregation and thinking how bold it is. I'm thinking this is something that takes a level of faith that says right from the start, you're okay with whatever you might face this week. What's more is you're prepared to trust God to solve it. And so with my daughter sitting next to me, I repeated nearly every word you spoke. 
I remember getting a lump in my throat because I wanted this prayer so much. I wanted it to be undeniably the work of God in my life. You see, I wanted this moment to speak loudly to my entire family, especially my mother and my daughter. Truth be told, I wanted the moment to be permanently etched in my mind so I would never resolve to lean on my own strength again. I went home sun that Sunday and prayed that same, same prayer that night. I also asked God to shut doors he didn't want me to walk through. But here's the thing. From a self-employment perspective, it meant the possibility of proposals being denied or postponed. Simply put, it could mean no income for my family. Believe it or not, on Monday, I started receiving emails from nearly every potential client that I had sent proposals to. Every single one postponed the time frame. By Thursday, all of my proposals had been denied. I, I looked at the calendar, get this, on Tuesday, the 15th of October, I would have $1,194 in bills that would be due. Listen to this number one more time. 1,194, that's important, I'm gonna come back to that. Without new business, there would be no way to pay those bills. This meant that I had Friday and Monday to secure new business and collect payment, not to mention that Monday's Columbus Day, a holiday. Did you know that? But that's not all. Thursday evening, I, I received word that there's an urgent financial need of $2,000 from a family member. I remember saying to myself, this is it. This is the moment. I have to trust God to solve this. And as I began to pray for God to solve this, the devil whispered seeds of doubt and guilt into my head. He begged me to question this moment. He asked, perhaps this moment is not what you think. Maybe you're being punished for the times when you didn't obey God. This was clearly a tipping point for me. So what did I do? I told the devil to leave me alone. <laughs> I told him this is between God and I. And I spoke of how God can meet all of my needs. I continued my prayer and put all, all of it in God's hands and I stayed true to what I had prayed uh, um, for that week. It's now Friday morning and my phone rings. Someone I had spoken to at least six months uh, ago called. It is for work totaling $1,197. God was off by a little bit. <laughs> and they said, I can pick the check up on Monday. I kid you not. And then 30 minutes later, the phone rings again. It's a lady who I've never met. She lives in Austin, Texas. She was referred to me by someone else uh, who, is a fr who is friends with me and one of my clients. She needs my help and is submitting a proposal. It will meet the financial need of $2,000. What's more, they're in a hurry and they want to close business by next uh, week, Wednesday the 16th. <laughs> as soon as I set the phone down, I cried. I cried like I haven't cried in 35 years. You know how we, we, uh, we are asked to have a childlike faith I've always struggled with that notion personally, mainly because at a young age, I was taught that if things are gonna get done, you better do it yourself. This idea got cemented in my head the day I learned the truth about Santa Claus. Before knowing the truth, I saw Santa as a great equalizer, the one who leveled the playing field, demographics such as income, it didn't matter. I honestly believed that if you asked, believed, then it would be given. And when the truth about Santa was revealed, my conviction around asking, believing, and, and receiving, it vanished with it. Gone was a childlike faith in everything. So when I say I hadn't cried like that in 15 years, it meant this. The last time I cried, I cried like that was when I, was, I had asked and believed in a wish for Christmas. It was a Christmas morning when I tore open the wrapping paper and there before my eyes was the one gift I wanted, the impossible gift. It was the one that, that could only be made possible by the power of Santa. Today, I feel like my childlike faith has been restored. I have this gift of this moment being etched in my heart and my mind. I have a testimony to share with others about the power of God, about the power of his grace, his mercy, and his love. I have a renewed sense of peace around not being condemned or punished. I have an even stronger conviction to lead more people to knowing what joy and peace feel like, the kind only Christ can give you. Most importantly, the desire to lead people to knowing the love of Jesus, with what it means to lean on his strength and have a close relationship with him. Wow. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes? 
I want to pray for you in just a second. But I want you to think, just with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, I want you to think about that first question. What's the center of my life? What's the center of my life? If it's not Jesus, then why not? If it's not Jesus, then I'll tell you what's happening in your life right now. There's a lot of worry. There's a lot of stress. I want to pray for you. And then I'm going to ask you to pray a prayer with me. Heavenly Father, that first question is essential to our lives. What's going to be at the center of our lives? I pray, Lord, that we would come to that point where we're so stressed out, where we're so anxious and so full of worry that we would just go, okay, God, I get it. I need you to be at the center of my life. I need to focus all of my life around you. Thank you for that peace that comes when we do that. Now it's your turn. I want to lead you in a prayer, and I I want you to pray this, not out loud with me, just pray this in your heart, but pray a prayer that would go something like this. Say, Jesus, I want you to be the center of my life. If that's you today, just say, yeah, God, that's what I want more than anything else. And that stress, that, that fear, I just give it to you. And I am trusting in you, Lord, because I, can, I know you can take that thing in my life that causes me so much stress and fear and worry, and you can help me grow as I trust in you, as I realize that you are faithful all the time. If that's you today, just go, yeah, God, that's me. Heavenly Father, help us. As we go through problems in our life and stresses in our life, I pray that we would lean hard on you In Jesus Christ's name, I pray these things. And all God's family said, would you stand with me for a closing word? My closing scripture is from the Old Testament in Deuteronomy. So commit yourselves wholeheartedly to these words of mine. Tie them to your hands and wear them on your foreheads as reminders. Teach them to your children. Talk about them when you are at home and when you are on the road and when you are going to bed and when you are getting up. Write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gates so that as long as the sky remains above the earth, you and your children may flourish in the land the Lord gives to you and your ancestors.